it seems that this car is special enough that anyone that's had it understood that. You know, they're really unique cars. They're my favorite. The Roadrunner is my favorite car. You know, that, that was the best time of his life and it was his favorite car. This car was his baby. It was, uh, it was very special to him. This car has uh, transcended through, you know, our family um, from earliest memories to, to now. So it all began when my dad was in his early 20s. He was probably 20 years old and he bought a 1968 Plymouth GTX when he was in the Navy in San Diego and, and was racing that. Did all kinds of stuff like light weighting the bumpers and uh, porting the heads and, and stuff. So when he got out of the Navy, he drove that from San Diego back to Ohio. And along the way, this is a brand new car, uh, he was going through probably the mountains over in Colorado or something, and he still had his uh, extra capacity oil pan and thought he had enough oil in it, and apparently he didn't, so he spun a, a rod bearing and had to have uh, engine work done. So all that, he gets back to Ohio and is looking through, I don't know if it was Motor Trend or, um, Motorcraft or one of those magazines and saw the 1969 and a half Plymouth Roadrunner A12 car with the liftoff hood and I remember him telling me he just had to have it. So he went down to the local dealership in Chillicothe, Ohio and they said they had one coming in and he said he would take it. And he didn't get the best deal on it, traded in a brand new um, GTX for uh, quite a loss and paid sticker for the Roadrunner but he was so excited and he said he left the dealership not quite sure how he was going to pay for it but he did it anyway and it was going to be a dedicated race car and uh, he told me that when he worked at the, the RCA plant when they made uh, TV uh, picture tubes that he would be looking for car transports and to see if it was on there when they were going to deliver it. Um, once he got the car, his, the family drove in a retired police car for the family car and he had a brand new uh, muscle car to race uh, on the weekends and uh, that's what he did. He brought it in and cut metal out from behind the seats and uh, did all kinds of crazy stuff that I couldn't imagine doing with a brand new car, but it was his race car. and. You know, later when he was in his early 70s, and I asked him what what was it, your favorite car, and he said the Roadrunner. It was always that car was his favorite. Wow, you've owned a lot of cars. Yeah, it's enough, isn't it? Mm. What What was your favorite car? Probably the Roadrunner. And he raced it from that time. Um, he did. I did hear from my brother that. Uh, you know, when he drove it on the street on occasion, the, it ended up being the car that uh, my older brother was brought home from the hospital in. So maybe they didn't trust the, the retired police car to drive him home, but that's a pretty cool story because, um, you know, 52 years later, my brother got to drive that car for the first time in his life. You videoing or taking a picture? Video. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Whoa! <laughs> hey Kelsey, I held on to the phone at least. This ain't no NXX. It's actually kind of difficult for me to think of a first memory of the Roadrunner. You know, Dad bought the car just a few months before I was born, so it was just kind of always there. It was uh, part of the family. Um, if I think back, I guess uh, when I was probably around four years old, I remember pretty specifically being uh, thrown around that back seat, you know, no seat belts at the time, and Dad loved to uh, stomp on the gas pedal and throw me around back there. He laughed about that for years afterwards. Uh, 
So I guess I guess that would probably be my first memory, just being <laughs> being tossed around as a little kid in the back seat of the hot rod. Um, my first memory of the Red Runner was taking a ride with my dad down Egypt Pike and riding in the back seat. And there weren't any seat belts, so we just slid across the back seat the whole time. And he would always do burnouts and make my mom crazy. Fast forward early 70s, like 1974, he'd been racing it. Um, had swapped out and put a Hemi in it for a while and just did a few things, but you know, he had uh, a son and was just kind of moving on in life. He owned a, a automotive repair business. So it was just time to move on in life and he ended up selling it to some local guys and uh, miraculously it didn't get destroyed. Uh, it seems that this car is special enough that anyone that's had it understood that and they didn't mistreat it too much. <laughs> they raced it and probably my dad was the worst, uh, I guess, steward of the vehicle through his days and it disappeared from our lives and uh, honestly I wasn't born then, I was born in 76. Uh, so then fast forward when I'm a teenager, I was into dirt bikes and not particularly good on uh, dirt bikes so I wrecked had an accident and ended up uh, life flighting me to the hospital and a few things. My dad thought it'd be a good idea to get me off dirt bikes and into something uh, with four wheels and that was going to be a, a Mopar. Uh, ended up buying a 65 Plymouth but again the Roadrunner just always came up in all the stories and what we were we were doing and he wanted to have that car back. We just never thought it would be possible so this is you know, 1990, I'm 15 years old, and we did know a local guy who at one point had owned it, um, Mr. Hoagland, and we asked him when we saw him at a car show, just coincidentally, hey, do you know where that car is? Have you ever heard anything? I think it, there's a guy over in Coshocton, Ohio, and he goes by Mr. Mopar, of all things, and he was in the phone book by that name. It was not something I would imagine today. I guess you might have a website or a uh, uh, Twitter or Instagram that says that, but now we looked it up in a paper phone book and, and found this guy in Coshocton and, and just went to meet him. My dad was outgoing and just called the guy up and he was a nice enough guy. And uh, so we just went over to see it. And I mean, I felt like um, it's not like you're seeing a, a ghost, but it's like a legend that you see like in, in real person. It was um, it was a really strange feeling like you just you wanted to touch it to see if it was real and I, I'll never forget that I think they were in it together it's probably like one of those wink wink things because it had some sort of cherry bomb gas uh, glass pack mufflers on it and they fired it up and I, I jumped about two feet in the air and, uh, but I just thought it was you know, the coolest thing ever. And it was neat just to know that it existed and it was in, you know, reasonable shape. A year later, uh, you know, we had talked to the guy. We'd just go kind of like visit the car. It was interesting. But uh, the guy said he'd like to sell it. And uh, we said, we'll take it immediately. And we drove it two hours from Coshocton to Chillicothe, which I just can't uh, fathom right now. But when we got home, we put it up on the the lift and realized it was one of the more dangerous things we had ever done the drive shaft was falling out of it the the bolts were backed out the pitman arm and the steering fell off into two pieces in our hands and um probably a lot more stuff that my dad just didn't highlight but we made it it made it and uh yeah he cleaned it up yeah he didn't have money to restore it um it was decent 10 footer car 10 or 15 footer car um, took it to some local car shows and you know really made his day but the fact that he didn't have the money to restore it it really just kind of lingered out there and lost interest I mean he was interested in going to a lot of car shows he did collect a lot of parts which came in handy later um, but overall just being able to restore it was was not in the cards for him so then we would fast forward from there and I was a teenager and in high school and even at one point he pushed it out into the driveway when after I was in college and uh, right after I was getting out of college and it deteriorated more, it didn't run anymore and some of the rust 
spots, the few that it had started to pop out. And we got in a few spirited discussions. I may have called him selfish once or twice um, for pushing it out in the driveway. Uh, but finally, in uh, 2007 or eight, uh, he had some other projects he wanted to do, and so I bought the car from him just to uh, preserve it, and then I stored it uh, across a couple of places that we lived. We were in an apartment while we were building our house. The Roadrunner stayed in the garage, so my wife and the kids, we all uh, got our cars snowed on and, and did all that, and the Roadrunner stayed inside the garage. Uh, when it was, I think maybe I'd had it 10 years or something like that almost, and been saving up money the best I could. But my dad's health really started to, to falter. He uh, had had heart trouble through, you know, most of his, uh, I don't know, not most of his life, but he'd had heart trouble since he was probably in his uh, late forties and had been a smoker. And so I knew that was out there, but then he uh, got cancer uh, there in 2017 and, uh, wasn't quite sure, you know, what was, in, you know, how much longer he had, how much longer he'd be with us. So talking to my wife, we actually had done a refi on a house and uh, decided just to go for it. And he had befriended, you know, back in the 90s, uh, Roger Gibson, who most people call like the, the grandfather or uh, God, not godfather, but uh, like the, the guy that brought that Corvette restoration mentality to the Mopar uh, world and world-class restoration guy and has done some of the most expensive and rarest cars um, Mopars and Corvettes in the world and uh, fully uh, respected across the industry. I met Lloyd way back I don't know the exact year but it was in the early 90s at Columbus Ohio at the Mopar Nationals. We were set up selling parts and we had some 69 and a half parts and um, we started talking and he said he was the original owner on one so that interested me and we just became friends after that. You know he come down and his interest in in the uh, 69 and a half stuff was the same as mine you know those are my favorite cars and obviously it was his too he was a mechanic and I was a mechanic, so, you know, we had a lot of stuff in common. When my dad wanted to get to know somebody, he found the best. And of course it was more than he could afford. Um, and I called Roger a couple times, uh, but this, this last time I called him, I just said, I'd like to do it. And he said, come on out and we'll, we'll chat about it and, and figure it out because I wasn't wealthy. And uh, he knew that, but he was great. Um, you know, I paid him, but he talked me through it. He was very reasonable uh, with us. He was gave me all the options that, uh, you know, were out there. But before we get to that, I think we should back up and say, you know, what we were doing or how we set up the restoration because we didn't want my dad to know about it, which was tricky. So a friend, Brian Baker, came over one day and we loaded up the Roadrunner and moved it over into a storage building and uh, my, had my dad come over and help. He said, I need to get it out, out of the way because, you know, we've been parking it in our garage for 10 years and just need some space for a tractor, etc. I have a picture of my dad washing it that day and him saying, you know, that, that was the best time of his life and it was his favorite car. I didn't push the point that I hadn't been born yet, so I'm not quite sh I don't think he was connecting the best time of his life to pre-me, pre, pre me, but uh, he uh, definitely, as I'd said before, he that was kind of just encapsulated his uh, prime of his life when, you know, everything was before him and he uh, was really having fun doing things. So we, we went to the storage building and put it in there with a, a one month uh, lease that I did for the storage building so he thought it was there and then after he left we went back and got it and loaded it up and I took it to Roger down in uh, Missouri to have him start the restoration very similar to when my dad bought the car and he walked out of the dealership thinking I don't know how I'm going to pay for this thing I felt very similar in the restoration process I thought how 
how am I gonna pay for this thing? But you know, Roger is very reasonable and uh, uh, took care of us, felt like um, family. So I uh, can't thank him enough and just very appreciative of what he did. And I think a lot of it was a testament to just uh, his friendship with my dad and, and what he thought of him. Well, I mean, overall, it was just an old car that was run hard and put away wet, but it was in good shape. Uh, you know, as far as the floorboards and all that, it wasn't rusty. It it uh, it just been drag raced, you know. But it was a good car, um, and you know, it it uh, it needed it all, just because of the race history. You know, anytime you race a car, you're cutting this and drilling that and taking this off to save weight and changing this to go faster. So it, you know, it needed a complete restoration, but overall it was a real good car. You know, they're really unique cars. They're my favorite. The Roadrunner is my favorite car. So the restoration ended up taking two years. Uh, a lot of the parts came in handy that my dad had collected. Uh, also, you know, Roger's expertise uh, kind of covered the rest. And, um, we're coming in close to the, the time they would be finished, but um, unfortunately, a couple things happened. Uh, my dad's cancer had progressed, and you know, so he ended up being in chemo and a few things, and uh, but finally, it, it got the better of him, and um, that compounded with his heart. Uh, he um, ended up going into the ICU, and. Uh, February of 2019. The, the car wasn't done uh, and we had, I thought it would be done but when we were putting the final touches on it, it found a crack in the head that was unexpected so the motor had to come back out and delayed uh, the delivery of it. So we didn't know if my dad was, he lost consciousness actually and I uh, didn't know if he was going to come out of it and uh, thankfully he did. It took a couple days and he came out so at that point you know, we wanted to surprise him with the car. You know, I had it in my mind that it was going to be parked in the garage and he was going to come over. And you know, I was going to, Krista, my wife, was going to say, Hey, I need you to get run up to the store to get something. And I was like, Oh, Dad, why don't you go with me? We'd go out in the garage and he'd see it. And I was going to say, Hey, do you want to drive? Um, that was just locked in my brain like it had already happened. And uh, I, I realized at that point that. It wasn't gonna happen that way. Um, but in the hospital, I took a computer in. Roger had mailed physical pictures to me, so I had a whole bag of pictures. And that was that's how we broke it to him. Just uh, I showed him, I was like, hey, I want you to see some pictures of something. And I started flipping through the restoration pictures of the Roadrunner, and he saw, you know, this bald-headed uh, guy in there. And it's like, do you know who that is? And he's like, no, I was like, oh, it's Roger Gibson. He's like, it is? It's Roger Gibson? And uh, he's like, yeah. And, He's like, why are you showing me a picture of Roger in his car? I was like, that's that's not Roger's car. That that's your car. That's the Roadrunner. And he's like, what? He just couldn't believe it. I mean, he was blown away. And you know, we got Roger on Facetime, and we were able to have him walk him around the shop and show him the car. And I mean, he just went from you know counting his last moments to uh, just elated. When dad found out the car was being restored, he was just over the moon. I mean, this 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 car was his baby. It was uh, it was very special to him. So to have someone like Roger do this restoration the right way and uh, to do a ground up restoration, I mean, I don't. I think he was just just couldn't believe it and uh, was very very happy and excited about that. I think he was super surprised and he was really excited to see the progress that they had already made on it and I think it really cheered him up when he wasn't feeling that great. I could tell he was uh, very surprised and kind of overwhelmed that your dad was doing that and it's like it gave him some energy or something and you know he got to where he would call and want to know this, want to know that and it's like it gave him something to live for. And through probably uh, two weeks in the hospital, yeah, at one point, even after that, we brought in the family to say goodbye. Uh, he was in at AFib and his heart rate was like 150, 60 beats per minute, just at, at a rest. 
um, not sustainable. But he was just so excited and you know, one day he asked to be moved or like, adjusted in his bed and we did, his heart rate snapped back into rhythm, dropped down into the 70s and he was fine. And they scanned his cancer uh, and the, the tumors in his brain and the other areas, they, they couldn't detect anything. And he was able to go home. As people were just amazed. The doctor said, like, uh, you know, one in a million. Like, they just, doesn't happen. They were already having us uh, make plans for his passing. And uh, so then the joke came, became he was decided to hang on because he wanted to see the car and drive it. Um, well, after he came home, unfortunately, you know, cancer's a, a really persistent thing. And it, it got him. Um, so May 11th, uh, 2019, he, he passed and um, wasn't able to see the car uh, in person. But, you know, my siblings, my brother and sister, they, you know, came in and we took it to Macaquin Car Show where it showed really well, um, but it really wasn't as important um, as the time for us to come together. So we have pictures of my little sister. I say little sister, she's, she's grown now but sitting next to the car and she only comes up to the top of the fender. And uh, right next to it, we have a picture of my older brother who's in his 50s that has the same, he was uh, the same height, his head was only coming up to the, the fender. When you first saw the car in Chicago, what was your reaction? I got a little emotional because <laughs> it was exciting to see something that dad liked so much. And we were all wishing that he could be there to see it too, because he would have loved it. We got to hang out and talk about dad and tell dad's story to a bunch of people and yeah, we had a good time. Well, that really has been one of the best parts about the whole restoration is that uh, it's brought us closer together as a family. Um, just able to spend time together and, and take the car to shows and, and show it off and tell the stories and, uh, you know, just reminisce and think about how much fun dad would have at these shows telling his own stories. and. It's really just made us, you know, appreciate him and appreciate our relationships. And, uh, and it's really, as I say, just made us grow closer together. And, and that, that part of it has just been fantastic. I'm so thankful for that. What would my dad say today if he could see it finished and, and get to drive it? I don't think he would want to talk about anything else. I, I think maybe even the grandkids would take a little bit of a backseat on that one. He, uh, I think it wouldn't be just talking to us, it would be all of the other people when we were at McCacken or uh, at some of the car shows locally, uh, you know, my siblings and I would, would talk about uh, just what it would be like and we think he would not wear out in, in the fact of just uh, talking to all the people and telling them all about it and probably gushing over his kids for um, you know, getting the car back into pristine condition. And uh, yeah, I think he would just be on cloud nine anytime he had a chance to talk about it. I'd be afraid that he might want to race it again, but since it's in my garage, I could control that, I think. Oh boy. If dad could see the Roadrunner now, <laughs> I, 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 it's hard for me to come up with words. I don't know. I think he would. Uh, I think he would be speechless. I really do. Uh, that car came out so beautiful. It's so perfect, and I think that he would just be flabbergasted. I think he would be at a loss for words. Um, uh, I think he may even shed a few tears because <laughs> this was this was his baby. This was his dream car, and to have it. Uh, put back to the condition that it's in it, he just he would just would have been uh you know happier than than I could ever imagine I we we talk about it how much fun he would have at the car shows talking about it and showing it off and and driving it I mean yeah I, I can't even imagine it's it's hard to picture uh you know because he was a pretty reserved guy but i think that uh i think that that <laughs> i think that the roadrunner in its condition would just melt him it was uh it's it's pretty incredible what would wood say if he could see the roadrunner today he would probably ask to drive it and do burnouts and dan would say no <laughs> if i could say anything to him about it uh 
I don't know if I don't know if I'd get any airtime. He would probably be doing most of the talking, but um, yeah, I think it would be a chance just to tell him what I've told countless people that you know have come up to see the car, and we were able to tell him the story. That it's just a testament to him. It's a way to honor him uh, as my dad. You know, I think that even me as a father, I don't, I'm not perfect, and, and my dad wasn't perfect. It's not about that. It's just who he is, though. He's my dad, and it was a really special uh, car for him and time of his life. And he passed that uh, down through the rest of us from just his memory of it, but also everything that was connected to it, uh, you know, working on cars, having a passion about something. And um, yeah, work ethic, everything was was connected and kind of around that. So I would probably say you're welcome, <laughs> but also just say, you know, this is for you. We just want to honor you and and let you know how important you are to us. That's the worst part of this whole thing is that he never did get to see it complete. And man, I. If I could tell him now that he would just be, he would be stunned. He would, it's just perfect. The car is beautiful. It's perfect. There's nothing more that could be done to make it any better. And I think he would just absolutely love it. Um, yeah, everything about it. It's just incredible. You know, it's part of the family and it really is. And so I guess I look at it like that. I look at it as a, you know, not even really a, a family heirloom, but more, again, more part of the family. It seems like a member of the family, not just a, a possession. So it's very special to me and, uh, and my siblings and the whole rest of the family. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess that's what it means to me as an adult. This car has uh, transcended through, you know, our family um, from earliest memories to, to now. And it, it's a real way to uh, continue the memory and the legacy of my dad. Um, it, you know, it's just a car, but it means a lot when it brings people together. Mm -hmm.